agency. It's fun. Um, we make everything from museum exhibits, uh, educational games, participatory consulting. If you move in the film industry and VR world at all, you might see me with my other analyst hat on in Khan and other places talking about the future of the screen industries, in which I am an expert. And I am not as um, emotionally invested in that as I am in this. And as you will see, because I'm emotionally invested in this, I will be speaking very fast. And when I'm on the phone, you can do this hand sign, which we will now practice, which means slower. <laughs> um, I'm on the board of the Swedish Film Institute, for instance. Uh, my company does also teach VR makers embodied storytelling, and I think at the end of this talk, you're going to understand why. But what I'm going to talk about today, today specifically is one of the things that we do, uh, which is LARP. Uh, previously, in, uh, if now it's not an a verb, in the United States and other places it still plays it's spelled with B, capital letters, and this is a bit of a shibboleth. If people who spell art in small caps tend to be connected to this international design discourse uh, that I also uh, represent today. And today I'm going to be talking specifically about Nordic or Nordic style art. I'm going to show you what it can be. I'm going to talk a little bit about the design principles and methods for underlying the best work. This talk is not going to be exhaustive. For instance, this recent textbook, which I edited, is 428 pages or something like that. <laughs> this is the basics. But we're going to cover some things today. So, uh, how many of you are from immersive theater? How many of you do digital immersive things? Yeah, well, how many of you are game designers of some kind? Great. Uh, so why is this stuff useful to you? I think mostly it's going to be these things. We make LARPs. There are basically no performers. Very few or none at all. So everybody you see in the pictures from the events are paying participants who have made their own costumes and are, are, are making the content together. We're able to provide the illusion of full agency for the participants. They feel there's a social contract and agreement. When we enter this thing, we're going to follow the rules and the, the narrative logic. But within that, they feel that they can do whatever they want. And the trick is to build the machine so that the outcome is beautiful and have a, a very high artistic quality. Sometimes you fool them to do things you want to do. Sometimes you give them actual agency. But they should always feel that they can do whatever they, that whatever they please within this context. The design tradition, which, which I belong, has over 20 years of systematic iterative testing of narrative design tools. Uh, and we have started answering, or we have long ago answered many of the the, the questions that immersive theater is only now starting to ask and identify uh, and we are is going to confront when it comes to the narrative stuff very very soon because of how embodied agency works um, and especially maybe the the you know, performers thing is something that's worth thinking about because when we think about scaling these kinds of events of course that's always a cost issue I'm not going to go into the history of the form so much, but what you need to know is that this so-called Nordic style of art is, uh, has some very different historical sources from mainstream art in the US and in, in Europe as well. So just like mainstream art, Nordic art has this sort of geek culture leg that goes back to tabletop role-playing and role-playing simulations and all the way back to Jacob Moreno in the 1920s. But in Nordic style, it's just as directly affected by the arts, by the history of performance, theater, dance, happenings, political activism, and, and so on. And the most important difference to most other kinds of game design is that Nordic LARP, in Nordic LARP you don't design a system to then run LARPs in the system, that a system the players, for instance, would then have to memorize to be able to play. You design each individual work from scratch, bespoke design. So every time you make a piece, an artwork, you start over with identifying your goals and your resources and who your participants are, and then you design the best piece with the best physical environment, the best rules, best mechanics, best story content, and the best participant culture for what your uh, the goals of your particular work is. And because LARP is an art form, the goals can be pretty heavy, as you will learn. So as not to scare you off, I will start directly by saying that the goals, of course, can also be entertainment. Uh, at PDA, we've been working for a few years with a company called White Wolf. Uh, let's let the chanting pass. <laughs> <laughs> or I will hover over the chapel. This is like the quietest it can be, but still on. <laughs> so, uh, we've been working for a few years with a company called White Wolf, uh, who control one of the biggest tabletop role playing ideas in the world. It's called The World of Darkness, it's better known as Vampire the Masquerade. Now, Vampire also has existing large LARP rules, which are fun in their way. They are totally nothing at all like the kind of LARP that I'm talking about here that you can also see in the video. So, White Wolf came to us in preparation for the recently released 5th edition, 
uh, on the tabletop game to create events that would both reactivate interest in the IP, which had kind of slumbered, and also just in, as importantly, we could use these events to help with IP development. So over the decades, World of Darkness role-playing had become very much a kind of goth strategy game that you would pose and scheme with superpowers, which can be fun, but it isn't very sort of meaty. But at its root, Vampire the Masquerade is a game about personal horror and about power, about corrupt influence in the world. So we designed and ran a series of official White Wolf LARPs in this Nordic style to explore and develop and to specifically test from a playability perspective some of these new directions uh, that, uh, for the story world that they were exploring and have now uh, also completed. Our first case was called End of the Line. It was sent uh, in an illegal dance club. Um, um, sorry. Yes. It was sent in an illegal dance club. Uh, and at that event, you will literally go to a club and dance in, a, in an illegal nightclub. Not actually illegal, but it looks illegal. <laughs> and you will experience what it is like on the street level to live in a world as a human where monsters exist and they will also hunt you. And we run that in Helsinki, New Orleans, and Berlin, and we're talking about touring it later this year also in the United States. Uh, then we did Enlightenment in Blood, that you saw the video of. It was a one-shot event that we ran for 400 super fans across uh, 11 lo locations in Berlin, uh, in uh, Anarchist Friedrichshain, and the goal was to simulate the physical reality of living in the world of darkness for just an ordinary night, which of course turned out not to be so ordinary. We also told us the story of the fall of the local Camarilla vampire prince. And we had an agreement with White Wolf that what happened at this event would become the canonical truth in the IP of the fiction. So if you now buy a set of Vampire Fifth Edition books, you will see, especially in the Anarch volume, not just a lot of uh, photos from our events, which is very cool, but also in, in fiction descriptions of the fall of the Prince of Berlin, which are the events that were created, uh, co-created by our participants uh, in this slide. And because we can't help ourselves, we also made an incredibly bespoke third White Wolf life for just 22 players that can explore the question that many of us who grew up with this IP have asked ourselves, namely, if these vampires are supposed to rule the world, but they also can't go out in daylight, like how does that actually work? <laughs> <laughs> the canonical answer is mind control and ghouls doing their master's bidding, and then just all the hand waving and don't think about it too much, but we said, no, no, like, this has to work. So uh, we had like, questions about the practical legislative level. Now in this picture, you see an, an image of the European Parliament, a meeting, this is how the sausage is made, so to speak, a meeting between stakeholders and lobbyists and politicians and parliament staffers uh, who are discussing a real-world political issue, in this case, uh, visa requirements between Europe and the US. In this picture, the parliament is real, the policy matter is real, the arguments that the different sides are arguing are real, but most of the characters in this picture are fiction. This is an actual play photo from our parliament of shadows. So we ran this event in Brussels uh, at the European Parliament, and we had the pleasure of having members of the European Parliament, so that would be the equivalent of your senators, basically, uh, participating in the LARP. Here we have Mia Pedro-Kumbo-Lanakti, who is a social democrat from Finland. Here we have Julia Rega, a Pirate Party member from Germany. This is Buffet in her actual office. Mia Pedro was in the meeting with us. And they and many of their parliament staffers were playing themselves, or sometimes evil versions of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and they were performing their everyday tasks but inside this fictional context. And in this other here, you can see a couple of participants getting into a translator booth to spy on the meeting that is just about to begin. And so we were using this, uh, this uh, space, these spaces. And uh, by the way, from a logistics perspective, like high security locations are a bitch. So maybe you can stop make more of your parliament things, but if I can make one in your Congress, I will. And so just call it. <laughs> In large theory, this design choice is called indexical representation. Basically, this is just semiotics, right? Uh, the, we have made the design choice in this large that the participants will be doing the exact same actions, including the real politics, that they would be doing if the situation was real. Um, but the character motivations are different. So if you work for, if you are employed by a secret cabal of vampires who rule the world, you will be very invested in issues like surveillance, visas, blood bank legislation, and so on. And we had actual <laughs> parliament staffers prepare policy briefs for all of our participants so that they would be knowledgeable about the issues. <laughs> we were very clear when we released this event that you kind of have to be a wonk to enjoy to play it. That said, of course, we did also some flashier actions. I think this might be the first occult ritual in the European Parliament building. Uh, we also had some other parts in other places in Brussels, private clubs and swanky hotels and so on. We had a cocktail reception at the top of the Arc de Triomphe, which I think is a venue I'm not going to give with my career. 
Um, and the budget was carried uh, entirely by participant fees, and we just like we waived our fees pretty much. I can't remember if anyone uh, at our end got paid because this was just a fashion project. But neither did White Wolf, and I think the participants paid, paid less than five hundred dollars a head for this cost spending money. And there was also even some action at the end here, one of the vampires is getting fritzed with sunlight at the end of the story. All of these pictures are by Klaus Kuikkonen, who is the best documentary photographer of LARPs in the world. So what does it feel like to participate in a LARP, like, in a piece like this? Especially when you're doing something ostensibly boring. You know, we were actually talking in our design practice about the aesthetics of boredom. Especially in longer pieces, you need to build in a lot of like boring downtime to, to pay to create pace uh, for the participants because nobody can perform on, on this intense level of time. But if you look at the faces of these people, you can see in their eyes that there is a lot going on, even though they are debating the policy issue in the in a, in a parliament room. Uh, and again this no, none of, nobody here is an act an actor. And if you look at this particular very focused Finnish man over here, he was happened happened to be wearing his fitness monitor and later <laughs> shared with us cross-reference the timestamps of his elevated heart rate notifications against our pictures. So here we can see that at this moment in this meeting, his heart rate is up at 150 quite often. Uh, this feels great, is the answer. It is really exciting to live and act and be treated as though your fictional persona is real. Because in full agency storytelling, what you do really matters. Your choices shape the outcomes for everyone. And the reason it works is this social agreement that we're going to stay within the, the limits of the fiction, we're going to stay within the goals and the personality of each character, and we're going to stay within the rules of the event. And people do, they follow these rules, and these seemingly simple tricks of these social contracts allow people to tell magnificent stories together. Uh, with a complexity, of course, that you cannot predict. When you create them, you create the frame, but whatever they come up with is always going to be cooler and more coherent than, you had, than anything you would have planned in advance. Uh, and as with any participatory work, they will um, experience it from a first-person audience perspective. We call this an audience position inside the body of each participant. And I shall now share a video with our creative director, Bjarke Pedersen, who explains this in some way. The human brain is very bad at distinguishing between reality and fiction. It does not mean that we don't understand what is reality and fiction, but in the moment when you're experiencing it, that the brain has all the same reactions as if it was real. Studies have shown that if you change your physicality or you put on a costume or you're given an alibi to behave differently, you change your behavior automatically as a human being. So for example, if you put on a lab coat, you become more decisive and you become more authoritative with your language and in your body posture. And that happens unconsciously. It's the same thing in luck. My name is Jarek Pedersen. I've been LARPing for more than 20 years and designing for equally as long. LARP stands for Live Action Roleplay and Nordic LARP is a specific subset where we focus on collaborative storytelling. There's many reasons why people engage in LARP and for some of course it's escapism but I think the main reason is to be able to step into somebody else's shoes for a while and get a chance to see how other people function. And when you engage with characters that are profoundly different from you, you will learn that that character is also part of you and that maybe you can enhance the possibilities you have in your own life of engaging with other people. I think there's a movement toward being more active in stories and one of the big reasons of course that we spend so much time passively consuming stuff on screens but people want to engage with stories, they want to contribute and they want to be able to step into these worlds together and share moments with other fans. So in traditional storytelling you often follow one or several characters here, the only character you can engage with directly is your own. So you don't have one main character, you have a hundred characters. All participants need to feel like the hero of their own journey. You have to build trust amongst the participants to be able to play together and to uh, be vulnerable together and tell stories that are serious and fun and dangerous. Because without feeling safe you can't be brave and only by being brave can allow yourself to play around and be something that you are not. The way I see a lot is like a big interaction machine. So I create all the cocks and the wheels, and the cocks are the characters, it's the world, it's the morality of the world. But 
as the players and their input are put into this interaction machine, there will be an output. And that output is each individual has their own story told by themselves and it is a unique story. So whatever happens is the right thing as long as they adhere to the rules of the world. Then you have to trust your participants to explore the theme that you have set within the given framework and they will tell way more beautiful stories than you could ever imagine yourself. So, to touch on some of the points that Gary covered here, um, if we start with the character interface, so, so embodied role taking, embodied role playing is at the heart of, of this discipline and any kind of role playing, of course, and, and most kinds of participatory work, whether you, whether you trust the participants with an agency or not. And in Nordic style RPG, the character is the interface to the narrative. And the participant body is the interface to the character. And a character can be, we, be we use the term, terms thin or complex. So the thinnest possible character would be a version of the player who believes the fiction to be true. And I expect in, most of you who are doing uh, immersive work where the participants are the present inside the fiction, not just ghosting, that's probably what you're, what ultimately you're working with. A complex character that has a different background, separate psychology, a web of fictional relationships. And in addition to this, any character would of course have several social roles inside the fiction as well. So whether you're a thin or a complex character, it also has social roles. So role playing as a term, historical coincidence, often what we mean is character play. But part of character play, because of how human interaction works, also involves social role playing, all right? So uh, a character, theme or complex, would then also be able to be like a general and a wife, for instance, or a subject, or a student, or a customer, and so on. And again, if you don't work with character play at all in your work, you're still often working with role playing. And this is great, by the way, because humans are great at humaning. So you put them in a social situation where they know the script, and they can be a student. They know how to do that. They, can, they know how to be a guest at a wedding. Like, why are there so many ex immersive experiences about weddings? Because of exactly <laughs> this. You don't actually have to teach people how to do that. Um, fictional characters are constructs. We talk about them as though they're real because this gives us character alibi. That's the permission to not be judged by what happens inside the magic circle of the fiction, just like in our culture when we go to play or we watch a movie. We don't believe that the actor is actually a serial killer, for instance, or whatever. So we need that, uh, those kinds of agreements also for, for participants in participatory fiction. Um, and the, that's what the character alibi is for. And an interaction alibi is any rule or object or design element that allows a participant in any kind of experience to try something or do something that they wouldn't normally do. So when you design for participation, you always design for alibi. Agency is not enough. So agency would be the theoretical possibility to do something in the situation, but it's worth nothing if I worry, I the participant worry that I will be shamed for doing the thing that is theoretically available to me, right? So fiction provides alibi, character provides alibi, masks and costumes provide alibi. This is the main reason why we work with these tools uh, in participation. Uh, but actually, like these are just languages, that words, concepts, the things that you already know how to do. If you throw a party in your home and you want people to dance, you're very likely to turn down the lights and turn up the music. And the reason you do this is that changing the physical environment changes the social environment. And it pushes around the norm, tweaks the norms of what is normal behavior. And the moment you can change what is normal behavior, you have in fact created alibi to do the thing that is not normal behavior, for instance, dancing. What is expected, what is possible, what is normal. That is what alibi design is all about. And actually, like one takeaway, if you want to take one thing away from this whole talk, it's this. If your participants are not currently doing what you want them to do, it's not your participants that are wrong, it's you who are not doing your job. Mm -hmm. So, I make LARPs, and I'm going to talk at the end about another one of our pieces, but I have to say that I'm also an enormous fan of other people's work. It's certainly not just us who are doing this well. There are about a thousand designers in the world today who are doing this kind of work, who are pretty damn good. And I would say that there are perhaps a hundred whose skill I would consider to be on a, on a high professional level, some of them are in the United States, some of them might even be in this room. <laughs> non-profit environment, and they're doing that for a bunch of reasons. One is that the business model uh, is a bitch, as you know, <laughs> if you're making any kind of participation. And partly also because a lot of people want to make fan work and not get sued. Did any of you go to South by Southwest World? Yeah, congratulations. That was not possible for all of us. I went to actual West World. So, <laughs> being a fan isn't the same as always, isn't always the same as having fun. 
quite often in these pieces, physical discomfort, dark themes, even boredom, are part of the experience because of kids. You wouldn't watch a movie where only good things happen to the protagonists. Indeed, very often when we engage with stories, the most meaningful stories are tragedies. Are the Westworld also is a tragedy. tragedy. So I have been to Westworld last year. It's called something else because they don't want to be sued. Um, but also, the reason they have to do it, it's not that they don't want to do official work, is because in our culture, and perhaps particularly in American culture, you can tell a story on TV or on a theatrical stage that you then don't trust the audience to handle in other media, which is very weird to me as a European and as an artist. I promise you, I promise you that the sexual violence and the torture and the mindfucks of Westworld are so much worse and so much less trivialized when you engage with it in person with participants who are not there as a job, as somebody who needs to deliver you like a cool experience of being in this edgy thing. It's another cool thing. It's very weird when I go by the play or go to a LARP where the other participants, in this case also the hosts and the staff and so on, they're also humans. And my character thinks that they're robots who will then become sentient. They think they're humans, but they will become sentient. But of course we all know that everybody who's portraying these characters is an actual Human. Now, in your mind, you're not listening anymore to what I'm saying because I said sexual violence, and you're like, but how can you possibly do that? Uh, consent, my friends, consent and negotiations. I'll get back to that in a little while. Uh, non profit art design also worked a lot with original IP. So, just to mention some of my things that I did in my spare time last year, I was a counselor in a post apocalyptic military installation in a bunker for three days. Bunkers can be really cold. Uh, I was a murderer, a woman at the decadent fate court. I was tortured in a basement. I was a poetry teacher in a LARP loosely inspired by Donut Arts, The Secret History. This one and this one were at castles in Poland. If you want to do something in a castle in Poland, your production partner is called Turbo LARP. Schwistak right here is the person to speak to. The reason you want to do it specifically in Polish castles is that they are cheap. <laughs> Oh, and then there's great block production or even production infrastructure there. And by cheap, I, I mean not kind of actually cheap. Even in the non-profit environment, the participant prices are approximately the same as in the for-profit environment. So my events cost about the same as the non-profit events, which often means two to five hundred euros for three days, including food and board, which is far too little, as anybody who understands the math of these things can can say. But that's where the prices are right now. They're going up. I think we're going to see thousand-dollar events within a year. Than the market for them as well. Cool. So, but the fact that this discipline has grown out of the non profit environment for the last decades has led to some very specific consequences. And one uh, of these is also correct, connected to the price tag, which is nobody pays $500 to be an extra in somebody else's story. <laughs> so, we would like Becky was saying, like everybody has to be the main character. Well, this is for all kinds of reasons. Equality of outcome uh, is what we call this. And as a design goal, every participant has to have as cool an experience. I'm an enormous fan of Punch Drunk's design work, for instance, when it comes to things like uh, the physical environment. I am outraged that you can pay for a better experience. To me, that stands uh, completely against everything that, uh, that I believe in. We also talk about play to lose or play for story. And the reason for this is this. If you tell stories where the way to succeed, to have a good story, is only to win, then not everybody will be able to win, and then you cannot have a quality of outcome. So you have to tell other kinds of stories that have to be about something else. The many kinds of outcomes have to be as narratively satisfying. So when you go in, you don't know how it's going to end, but how it doesn't matter because whichever ending you get is going to be just as cool as all the other endings, whether or not your character succeeds in their goals or not. This is called play to lose in Europe. Americans cannot handle the concept of losing. Either it's called play to lift or play to pay for story. So fundamentally, Nordic art is collaborative. That is to say, the stories can be about competitive situations, and they often are for narrative satisfying reasons, but the players are not adversaries. The players don't have adversaries, they have co-creators. Everybody who participates in the piece are together, their goal, my goal as a participant, is that all of us are going to have a cool experience. My goal as a character, of course, is that I'm going to succeed in my goals. But quite often, my, my goal as a player will be for my characters to almost succeed and then spectacularly fail in some kind of heartbreaking manner. Because as we all know from, for instance, contemporary television, those kinds of stories are so much more interesting. It's so much more interesting to break bad than to like, feel good, right? <laughs> so 
And another thing that is, uh, is conceptually hard for people who come, especially from gaming uh, in, and game culture in the United States, is this idea of play as something serious. So when we say play, you have to think play like theater, not play like something trivial. Play can be enormously important. I think everybody, or you wouldn't be in this business, you wouldn't be at this conference if you didn't believe that play is profoundly impactful and meaningful and something very important for grown-ups to do. And that means that we have to be able to tell stories in these frames of play that are very, very serious indeed. Um, and of course, again, I keep saying theater, but if you can do it in theater or if you can do it in film, of course you can do it in a participatory case as well, as long as you do it respectfully uh, and, and, and with, uh, with good values, right, and tools. So Halat Star is a very good example of this. It's a Finnish-Palestinian co-production with, uh, with designers from both countries. Uh, it is um, a, a, an experience that takes a few days where you experience what it is like to live under, under the illegal occupation uh, in Ramallah, but it isn't set in Palestine because that there are too many culturally specific things that Nordic audiences wouldn't understand. So it is set in a fictionalized alternate history of Finland where that history has happened in Finland and Finland is illegally occupied by a country called Eurasia that is of course completely fictional. And the Nordic players are playing the oppressed citizens and the, the, the Middle Eastern players are playing the uh, well-meaning Westerners, so to speak, the NGOs and the journalists, and who come there and don't understand it. Well, I would like to help, and I, I'll tell you the, the satisfaction of people from Palestine who get to say the things to Westerners that they are told all the time is very interesting. <laughs> um, so, but this, you can't tell these kinds of stories without also talking about torture and people being disappeared and the daily humiliations of, of, um, of not being able to make it to work because you're stuck in, a, in an ID check and so on. And also about resistance and about the price, even of nonviolent resistance against an overwhelming force. This was made, this piece has been run twice, it was made with large funding. We explore historical topics. So one of the best parks in the world, if you're able ever to play it and get a spot, it's very competitive. But if you can get a ticket, I, I absolutely recommend it, uh, especially if you're queer. Um, Just a Little Loving uh, is an exploration of love and loss in the gay community as the AIDS crisis hits in the early 1980s. It's, I would say, perhaps a perfect mark. It's been around something like 12 times, and it was a masterpiece from the beginning, and it's been iterated on uh, even. And of course, it's fantastic for queer players to be in a fiction where queer experiences are the norm and the straight characters are, are marginal. Uh, but it could also be something like the suffragist movement or hope and community. Like even when we talk about heavy topics, of course, very often the stories are about community and love just as much as they are about suffering because that's how the world works. There are also other marks that are not realistic but much more conceptual and that they can also be quite fun. So for instance, the perfect human here is a one-day reenactment of August life in stock photos. <laughs> and they are really cheerful and positive and supportive all day. <laughs> now, all the examples I've shown you so far work with a design choice called a 360-degree illusion. That is to say that you have as your design choice uh, what you see is what you get, aesthetic. Everything looks like it would in the fiction. And for the first 15 years of our design practice, we really thought that if we can just build the complete visual surface, we will solve all the storytelling problems uh, involved. Pay no to VR people. That is not how it works. I'm sorry, we totally reached that goal about 10 years ago. We can build virtual reality, fully interactive virtual realities in the physical world, in any genre. And it, you know, you still have to do the storytelling work. <laughs> so there's actually another choice that you can make, and that's a big subculture that I'm not going to show more much of because it doesn't look as nice in pictures. But it's called black box art, black box art, and they're running theatrical black boxes. You take away the sets, you take away the costumes, and it's liberated. You are also liberated from the linear time and the 360 degree aesthetic. Often these are shorter format, very intense participatory experiences, often non-verbal, very thin characters, and so on. Uh, and there is a very big overlap in the narrative tools for what is possible to do with Black Box Live today to what is possible to do even relatively cheaply in VR today. So if you are uh, teaching VR, for instance, if you're making if you're making low budget VR things, you have to look into this because you have a lot of answers there. Okay. So then, like I said, you have to be, feel safe to be brave. The thing is, with a piece like End of the Wild that is set in a nightclub, we want people to do nightclub things. So that means that I take a group of total strangers and I need to get them to a level where they're comfortable, for instance, kissing each other or biting each other's necks four hours later. <laughs> or for a piece like in St. Hamlet, I'm going to talk about in a little while, I have six hours to get a bunch of mostly strangers to a point 
where they feel that they should they choose to, they can totally simulate sex acts with each other. Or you know, in another type of art that you can participate in acts of political oppression in a way where you feel safe and the person you are oppressing feels safe. This is not a trivial task. You need help an alibi design for that. And this, uh, the challenge of doing this led us to what ultimately might be the most important contribution of Nordic art to the participatory design discourse at all. So this is what for like the first 20 years, or depends on where you start, maybe in the 80s, let's say, the first 10, 15 years of Nordic art, let's say this, we, we thought that this is the discipline, and this is what, what art design is. You have this magic circle of the fiction, and inside is you make inside it you need world characters, relationships, setting, culture, simulation, mechanics, interaction, mechanics, rules, agency, costumes, and sets. And if all of that is flawless, the piece is always going to work. I'm sorry to say that it's not enough. We were very focused on things like what will happen in this LARP and what will the participants be doing. And these are core questions. And if you cannot answer those coherently, you haven't succeeded in making any kind of participatory piece. But we had an, an intuitive idea that if you just design the perfect experience, then people are going to perfectly play the experience. And that is not what happens at all. So we have now rechristened this runtime design. Runtime is the period when the experience is on, when characters are being played. Broadly speaking, that's. You know, we can talk about this in a theory discussion a bar later, but basically it's when people are playing characters this the wrong time. Now, if you want to do anything here that requires trust, it's kind of too late to establish that when people are already inside the experience. And if you come from the arts, you think, and especially if you come from performance, you think that it's cool to push the participants around. A, not cool. B, they're going to have to opt out so much sooner. If they have tools to choose to participate, they will do the most fucked up shit you can imagine. <laughs> but if you if you if you decide for them, they will think you're an asshat, and I think they will be correct. <laughs> so, um, in the spoke design, every experience is different, and this means that just like a video game or anything else, it needs to teach you how do I play this experience, how do I do this particular experience. So, and very often when I go to interactive pieces, I want to ask where is the tutorial and when are you going to tell me what the rules are? <laughs> if I put the VR, why do we make such VR installa installations around our VR pieces? Now, at festivals and other places, it's because the piece doesn't tell me how to do the piece. So you have to tell me how to do the piece. And that's, by the way, that's completely valid design choice. You can do it outside. So now when we talk about art design, we talk about everything that happens on location. Handouts, workshops, relationships, logistics, everything that happens from the moment they arrive is already part of the piece. That is the piece. And everything that happens after, by the way, when you think about how memories are constructed in humans, which like the last 20% of the thing in peak experiences, if you don't decide this, you're screwed. Which is to say, if I have to wait three hours for my coat in a line, that's kind of that kind of undermines all the glorious things that happened before. <laughs> yeah. No, just myself. Random example. Most of you probably. I'm not excited about the project line. Maybe put two more people there. I know they cost money. But if people take your experience 30% more, isn't that a great investment? Um, yeah. So it turns out that there's a limit for how much complexity you can actually uh, convey to people beforehand. So you need to do some things on site. And in particular, if you have any kind of physical consent mechanics, you have to workshop them on site. Everybody has to practice them together, or they are worth nothing. Worth nothing. Um, so that's. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're going to do a workshop on site, we're going to teach people some things and tell them some rules. That opens for a whole other set of priming tools and calibration as well. Um, Maybe sometimes you realize that the participants who show up, they were just never going to have a good experience at your thing. Some people are not. Okay, if you get the kind of experience who, who was never able to employ, uh, to enjoy your piece, whose fault is that? Yeah. So, um, of course, it is. expectation management is just as important a piece of it. And when you want to design for people's memories and legacy of the piece, some of that happens after they have left. So now we realize we're probably going to need another circle here for this whole thing. There's even more surface it than in designing, which is exhausting, of course. Uh, LARP is a society inside a society. Inside a society, says LARP theorist Eric Fackler. What he means, I think, is LARP is a fictional society inside a temporary society of the people who are experiencing that piece at that time, inside a continuous society of humans who have some kind of expectations about how they interact with other humans and also how they interact with the medium in which you are working. 
Uh, so for this reason, <laughs> you need a lot more stuff. I would, you know, I would make sure that you can, you can find this stuff on my name, just Google my name. But basically, the thing is, you're going to have to design everything that happens. And one of the reasons is that it's, again, like when they arrive on location, it's usually too late because, and I cannot believe that it took me like 17 years of working in this field to figure this shit out. Disappointment is always a function of expectation. So by the time they are disappointed, you can't make it right because you gave them the wrong expectation to begin with, which means, by the way, that if you put hype, if you attach hype to your piece to sell tickets, you're going to attract all kinds of people. You're going to completely lost, lose control over what your piece is. So it's not going to attract the participants who are right for your piece. It's going to attract people who think this is the cool thing to do, and then they're not going to enjoy your piece, and this is probably not a good design choice. You can also conceptualize these exact same diagrams and timeline that starts with the announcement of your piece. <laughs> and then it works, thank you. Uh, and then uh, it, it becomes a timeline. And these lines continue like this, and some things are happening outside here, outside, because these people, the inner two circles, they're on location, they're participating in their piece. Outside, a bunch of other people, like critics and rumors and colleagues, they're talking about your piece, but they're not even there. But they're also affecting what happens after. So you need to think about this because it affects the afterlife of your piece. Okay, I'm going to use my last time to talk about another piece of ours to give some shallow idea of how this all can work when we put this all together. But remember that this is bespoke design, which means that literally every piece will solve everything differently. And whenever you change one mechanic somewhere or one cho design choice somewhere, it's going to completely change how everything else works. Like we put in this piece, we put a lot of work in spatial design, and in run six, the castle, uh, which is the actual castle of Elsinore, which is in Denmark. Uh, had misplaced the radiators and it was four degrees colder in that room so people wouldn't take their clothes off in that room so like the whole spatial design of the whole thing changed and I'm very happy to be able to work to iterate on scale with very, very complex pieces so that I don't know this but in a way I'm also sad because when we say that everything is a designable sur uh, surface we're not joking like everything including the temperature of each space is something that you have to be aware of that is going to affect you. <coughs> So this is inside Hamlet, it's said that the actual castle Elsinore, which is uh, also from the 17th century castle. It was a very well-known building in Shakespeare's time, that's probably why he said, uh, said the play is the play there, even though he, of course, set it in a um, medieval period. You are the rot in the court of Elsinore, is our tagline. So in the play, of course, it has about 12 characters. So we have extrapolated a full court because there has to be more people in, in the court of Claudius. We have 100 participants in a two and a half day experience. It's a, uh, two days, so first about four hours of workshop, then two days, then a half of play, and then on day three there's an optional debrief. It's set in a parallel history Europe where the French Revolution has never taken place. So in this sort of 30s environment, it's still a feudal society. Uh, this is based on the Marxist reading of the play, uh, and also this very sort of Renaissance close to I'm a little major, like it's a thing. Illness metaphors uh, are very present. This idea that the corruption in the body politic uh, is, a, is a consequence of, of, of the head of state in the world. Right? Uh, and we are following the story of Hamlet, so the core characters of the play, so certain scenes from the actual text are, we break play to, to hear certain soliloquies, and all the players are instructed because they're all on the same journey. On some level, everybody is Hamlet. When the soliloquies are played, you take that as input for your internal journey for your character. And there are no performers. Hamlet, Gertrude, Gertrude Claudius, Ophelia, Polonius, and Laertes have to follow. They have to hit certain beats in the story because we know what's going to happen to them. But they are also paying participants. They don't pay more or less, but they have to show up a day earlier for rehearsals. And in practice, we can only cast people who have some stage experience so they know how to memorize big chunks of text. This is not LARP for everybody. So you can go to insidehamlet.com and navigate to the page, is this LARP for me? And there it will say the following. This LARP is played in a very physical style where dancing is dancing and fighting looks real. Real alcohol will be served, but players need to be intoxicated to participate responsibly will be removed from play. Comes with convincing looking alcohol free options are available. All genders, sexualities, and bodies are invited to act wicked and be beautiful at this LARP. During play, you are likely to become witness to nudity, public displays of affection and sexuality, or simulated but realistic looking sex, violence, or drug taking. A good minimum comfort level for participation is for you to be able to hold hands with or kiss a stranger lightly on the cheek. But whether gentle intimacy, portrayed lust, or pretended violence, you will always have full control over your own body 
and of the story you are playing. You always choose who to touch and control who touches you. You can always leave any situation and step outside the play area to take a break from the fiction as needed. This part is divided into three acts with break in, in between, and each of them has their own theme. The first one is decadence, which as a design choice I regret, because actually getting people into that decadence from zero is a bit of hard work. Um, one uh, of, the, of the changing rules in this LARP is that there is a poison present. If you taste the vinegar, you have been poisoned, but it works different in the different acts. In Act 1, it's an aphrodisiac. It can make you be very friendly to people, or it can make you fall in love with the first person you see, or you decide the effect. But in some manner, your character is nudged by the aphrodisiac if you are poisoned. Also, in the first act, there will be no violence, except for show, like uh, uh, entertainment dueling. The second uh, act theme is deception. And here the poison acts as a truth serum. If you are poisoned, you will tell your, your secrets to people. But of course, you are still in control. Perhaps you want to tell them every secret your character ever had from the time they were five. Or you want to just put all the interesting story content into play directly. It's up to you as a participant. If there is violence, it will always lead to injury. But you can still not be killed. And then, of course, this is a Shakespeare tragedy. So we do have to kill everybody by the end. By the end. <laughs> and the final uh, after the theme is death. If you are poisoned now, you will die. But again, you decide how long it takes. Perhaps, you, perhaps your character will die two minutes before the end of the day. Or perhaps they will die spectacularly in a murder-suicide pact with the others. Also, any violent altercation will lead to the death of at least one of the participants in this violence. And at the very end, the, 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 the um, clock's will ring again. And Fortinbras will come in with his Marxist rebels and put all the survivors, survivors against the wall and execute them. And at this moment, uh, the, everybody who is dead is now present as ghosts. And as in this, uh, this line where you're being executed, you will decide for yourself, does my character deserve to live? If so, you remain standing. If your character does not deserve to live, they usually don't because of the way the power corrupts absolutely in this sort of Hitler bunker that basically is the setting of this environment. And you fall. And that is the end of the, the story. It's pretty intense, so that's what we need to be with. We also have a big party after two different friends. Now, you want to make a distinction when you start thinking about consent in your work about between physical consent and story consent. Right? So physical consent is what will my body be doing, what will be done to my body. Story consent is what kinds of narrative situations can I be exposed to or uh, expected to participate in. And that's why it's so important to have that very specific list of certain themes you know, on the piece so that people understand what, they, what you cannot opt out of. Like in this particular one, political oppression and violence and incest and sexuality are present in the story so much you cannot do handle it without them. So if you can't engage with those themes, you cannot do the piece. And that's totally fine, by the way. Uh, but then on the level of what happens in the scene to scene level, we won't give people power to negotiate. Um, when we ran into the line, the nightclub thing in New Orleans, we had a participant afterwards, a woman, tell us, this is the first time in my life I felt fully in control of who touches my body. And I think that says something terrible about how we run societies. But it also talks about the importance, you know, to be able to give people, we just want to make a full cool vampire experience, but if you can give people the experience of what it actually feels like to have physical autonomy as a woman in a nightclub or in the world, or as a man, you know, in the world, that is a big deal. And that's why we have to take this stuff seriously. And I mean, I have very few minutes left, but the work we do in, in for inside Hamlet, is the ingredient list are, is very clear on the website, as well as quite specific things, descriptions of the kinds of things that will happen in this experience. We have a safe word, we have an escalation and de-escalation mechanics, so you, if you say, slip the word rotten into a sentence, it means give me more, more of this, you're a you person who is shouting at me, you're so rotten, you're a rotten human, more. It can also mean you invite to escalate, perhaps you can start pushing me around. If I say the word pure in a sentence, it means we're fine, but more like maybe let's step it down a little bit. And of course, we practice this. We use a physical tap out to just take a step back and give the person the possibility to leave if they want to do that. Uh, we use a sign called look down, um, which is basically if you walk in on a scene that you kind of don't want to participate in, but like you, you, you can just do this and walk off. This means I, the participant, I'm not like I'm going to leave for some other character reasons. Don't engage me right now, but like we're cool. And then the culture design is so important. And this is, of course, the design both of the participant culture and the trust building and all the exercises and everything about how you are met at the gate the, the, from the, what happens in workshop and so on. But also the culture of the fiction. So we have just decided in this castle, you can always leave. Even if the king says, stop, you can be like, and walk off. 
and that's totally fine. So there is no narrative reason for you ever to remain in a situation that you don't want to be in. Okay, final minute. What are your core sort of design questions for any kind of participation? I think it's these. What kinds of activities will my participants be doing? If I'm just walking around, following a story along, but I'm not actually doing any other verbs, then it's just a less comfortable way to watch a theater, you might put some other verbs in there. How are these verbs that the participants are doing connected to the themes of the piece? If they are not connected to the themes of the piece, they are just decorative, they are pretend interaction, then the people are not in the piece. The verbs have to have to do, like inside Hamlet is all about corruption and power, so the verbs that people are doing has to be about corruption and power. What kinds of social and physical frameworks will allow the participants to do the things that you want them to do? And that's, you know, well, everything we've talked about. But you have to think a lot about everything from like how chairs are placed in a room to, to what kinds of language you're using in your newsletters or on your ticket. Uh, what has been important for us and what we always, always say at our office of PDA is the opposite to design is tradition. The moment you're not looking at every possible design choice in your process as a choice, you're following a tradition, and tradition might be great, but it might not be what your particular piece needs. So you need to look at every choice uh, as a choice because everything is a designable surface. Now, I hope that I have answered in this indirect manner why this, this way of thinking about experience design as a series of design choices uh, is useful for you, even if you're in other uh, disciplines. I will end on this slide, which you should take a picture of, <laughs> because this book is like gold dust. Like getting a copy of this book, Art Design, is very, very difficult. However, you can go to heartofthedearycorn.com. A deer corn is like a deer unicorn. Heartofthedearycorn.com. They have like two copies, I think, still, or maybe five, I don't know, but they have some. Uh, I have one. So the first person to come to me with 30 bucks has that book. Uh, and, um, and otherwise, email me. So the moment the book is on sale, uh, I can get in touch with you. Thank you so much.